Welcome to this fifth and final video in the series of virtual pilgrimage from St. George's College in Jerusalem. In this video, we are going to focus on places associated with the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Of course, that focus will take us to the great Church of the Holy Sepulcher, the most holy shrine in all of Christendom. Now, most pilgrims will not approach the great church of the resurrection from where I am sitting on its roof. But from here, we can see so much of its history. The ruins of the arches of the old Augustinian friary can be seen behind me, along with ancient cells that were built on top of this roof and are still inhabited by Ethiopian monks. We're going to be taking a look at the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension through the eyes of the Eastern Orthodox community. Most Christians in this land are either Greek Catholic or Eastern Orthodox Christians. And the imagery of their churches and the design of their buildings is quite different from what we may be used to in the West. So throughout this video, we're going to be looking at Eastern Orthodox icons. An Eastern Orthodox Church can look very busy to Western eyes with artwork. That's because all of these holy figures are meant to be present with us in our worship. We are meant to emulate them, and they come to comfort and to teach us. What will they have to say to us as we learn more about the crucifixion and resurrection and ascension here in Jerusalem. When Jesus was crucified, the area where I am standing was outside the city walls. It would not be enclosed within city walls until about 10 years after Jesus's lifetime. And so we are here at the Church of the Resurrection or the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Sepulchre means tomb. And this great church behind me was set in the fourth century within a deep and wide limestone quarry that lay outside the Ganath Gate of the city walls. There's probably no more complex site in all of Jerusalem. The archeology span here, the history here is so amazing and also quite frustrating for us to get a picture of how this building used to be and why it's in the form that it is now. Pilgrims are often surprised to learn here at the Church of the Resurrection that both the site of Jesus's crucifixion on Golgotha and his tomb are covered by this great church. In Constantine's fourth century church, the rising rock of Golgotha was outdoors in a courtyard. The medieval builders enclosed the rock of Calvary and pilgrims who came until the early 19th century would have to climb these steps and enter this area above called the Chapel of the Franks to see the rock of Calvary indoors. After the great fire of 1808, the large door, one of two to the main church, was blocked and behind it was built the stairway up to Calvary that is used today. We enter the church much as it was when it was dedicated in 1149 by the Crusaders. It's a Romanesque style church with an ambulatory that goes around behind the main altar. Typical of these churches were chapels in the ambulatory. We're going to turn 
and walk downstairs, deep into the quarry, under the church. Finally, we arrive in the lowest place, the chapel of the finding of the Holy Cross. Here we see the statue of St. Helena, mother of King Constantine, who is said to have found three crosses on this spot, one of them the cross of Jesus. The surviving walls of the ancient quarry can still be seen in this chapel. As we ascend, we stop at another underground chapel, the Chapel of St. Helena, an Armenian Orthodox church, both very ancient and very new with resplendent dome paintings that were begun in 2017. Finally, we walk up to the main level and stop to look at something quite interesting. It was customary for groups of pilgrims in the medieval period to carve crosses, one for each of their number, on the walls of the church. As we go back through the ambulatory, we stop at one of the places where the Rock of Calvary can be seen. It is simply a part of that ancient quarry face that has been rising high underneath the church. And finally, we turn into the chapel of St. Adam. In Eastern Orthodox tradition, Jesus was crucified over the grave of Adam, the new Adam, over the grave of the first Adam. Let's go with this Ethiopian family that is walking up now to the Roman Catholic Chapel on the top of the Rock of Calvary. And then they enter the Eastern Orthodox Chapel with its beautiful gold and silver decoration. An Armenian Orthodox deacon comes daily to sense the altar and it's customary for pilgrims to kneel beneath the altar and to put their hands in the hole there to reach down to touch the rock of Calvary. A reading from John's Gospel. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. One way to wrap our mind around the crucifixion of Jesus is to remember what our versions of capital punishment have been. Jesus gets not just the electric chair, but something more like the hangman's noose. The body that is to be resurrected has not died in a beautiful, peaceful way. It has been badly, scornfully abused. Icons and other religious art have not shied away from portraying Jesus' suffering. Where do you see the suffering of the world? We leave the top of Calvary 
and descend its steep stairs. A beautiful mosaic awaits us, a mosaic with three separate panels. Note in this crucifixion section the skull of Adam beneath the cross. The preparation of Jesus' body for burial, and finally at left, his burial. In front of this great mosaic is the stone of the anointing placed there by the crusaders. It's customary for pilgrims to bring sweet oils and to pour them out on the stone to remember where Jesus' body was prepared for burial. Pilgrims will venerate the stone and even bring holy objects and even their grave clothes to rest upon the stone for blessing. Let's leave the church now and go to an area that in Constantine's church was the baptistry, but today offers us a surprise. This courtyard church. This is the icon screen or iconostasis in the courtyard church of the Cathedral of St. James in Jerusalem. Holy Sepulchre is not the cathedral. This small church is a wonderful place, resplendent with ancient icons and the feet and the prayers of centuries of pilgrims and the local Greek Orthodox community that worships here day by day. When an Orthodox worshiper comes into a church, they will light candles because, as one Orthodox priest said to me, can you ever have enough of the light of Christ? And then they will go right up to the icon screen and venerate the icons. Even with the noise of the ever-present construction at Holy Sepulchre, we have found a quiet corner at the back of St. James Cathedral, where we look at the famous icon from the 15th century, known as the Virgin of Jerusalem. From this Armenian Orthodox chapel with its mosaic of the crucifixion and the prayers of the faithful, we get our first glimpse now into the rotunda of the church, a rotunda that survives largely from Constantine's time. A Coptic Orthodox monk is taking a nap in the chapel attached to the tomb. We see the ancient columns and watch as a Roman Catholic Mass is being celebrated. This is the central part of the church, the Catholicon, belonging to the Greek Orthodox. We look up into the magnificent dome with its mosaic of Christ, the ruler of the universe. An Armenian Orthodox deacon goes to sense the tomb. This edicule, or little building, stands above the rock-cut ancient tomb. The pilgrims line up to enter the two chambers of the tomb, The first, the chapel of the angel, and finally the second, the inner tomb, where pilgrims kneel to venerate the place where tradition says Jesus' body lay. Lamps are kept lit 24 hours a day. 
here a Franciscan friar comes and pours corn oil into the lamps and places a new wick in each. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guard shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. And he said, come see the place where he lay. Christos Anesti, Alithos Anesti, the people cry at the service of the holy fire on the day before Eastern Orthodox Easter Day. Fire comes from inside the tomb, and the faithful take their bundle of 33 candles and light it from that fire, shouting, Christ is risen, indeed he is risen. The fire is put on an airplane and sent to Athens. Alleluia, Christ is risen. And in the Orthodox icon of the resurrection, our Lord stretches his hand out to bring Adam and Eve up from their grave. The Gospels contain a wonderful variety of stories about the ways in which the disciples discover that Jesus is alive again. They include those who get to actually touch Jesus, those who get to only see and hear him, those who get to walk and talk with him, those who get to dine with him. It is a wonderful variety indeed. In our own time, um, I know plenty of people who would say that they are in touch with a Jesus who is alive. And although they may not physically see and touch him, they know he is in our midst. I invite you to think today about the ways in which you may perceive and know that Jesus is alive and in our midst once again. We started this pilgrimage on the Mount of Olives. We're also ending it here on the Mount of Olives because many Christian traditions say this is the site of Jesus' ascension. When Jesus' disciples had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that my Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. 
This beautiful orthodox icon of the ascension of Jesus clearly shows that it took place on the Mount of Olives. Do you see the olive trees there in the center of the icon? The disciples below, and typically with the Eastern Orthodox, the Virgin Mary in the center of the disciples in a prominent place. Pilgrims started coming to this land to see the places associated with Jesus in the third and fourth centuries. And by the fourth century, the place was becoming covered with Christian shrines. Later in the fourth century, an aristocratic woman named Poimenia, herself a pilgrim, gave the money to build a church and a monastery on this site. And she built a church around a piece of exposed bedrock that pilgrims believed had one of the footprints that Jesus made as he ascended into heaven. The Byzantine church was octagonal because it covered the shrine of the ascension and the footprint. This small octagonal chapel was built in the 12th century. First, it was built by the conquering crusaders who took Jerusalem in 1099. After Jerusalem fell to the Muslims in 1187, it was converted into a mosque. The place is also a place of Christian worship on the great feast of the Ascension. On Orthodox Ascension Day, it's an incredibly colorful festival. Liturgies are held by the different Orthodox churches of the land, and there's a grand festival and hubbub of competing liturgy and singing. For truly, the Feast of the Ascension caps the church's year. Here we are in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. That's the traditional site of Jesus' ascension. As I reflect on the ascension, I have looked at uh, numerous artistic renderings of it, and they're often wonderful except for the fact that Jesus seems to be going away, and in some cases even almost waving goodbye. Whereas actually, what happens after Jesus' resurrection is that he is available for 40 days to his disciples here in the Jerusalem area. And then at the moment of his ascension, he becomes available to everyone throughout the world and throughout time. This is what we celebrate at Jesus' ascension. I'm Hussam and I am the Anglican Archbishop in Jerusalem and I want just to thank you very much for journeying with us virtually with St. George's College here in Jerusalem, a center of pilgrimage in the Diocese of Jerusalem and our beloved Anglican Communion. We would like to see you here in Jerusalem so that we can journey together, we can pilgrim together in the footsteps of Jesus here in the holy city of Jerusalem and beyond. God bless you all and see you soon. Assalamu alaikum. Goodbye from St. George's College.